pray. Father in heaven, we come right now to say thank you. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to come tonight and study the word of truth. Lord, we pray right now as we study as saints in the body of Christ, and uh, we, we pray that we will be encouraged, uh, we will be enlightened, and we will be edified. And we thank you for the gospel, and that is that Jesus Christ died, buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. If there is someone listening tonight, who just heard the gospel of salvation. That's the gospel of the grace of God. If they put their faith in that gospel of the grace of God and the finished work at Calvary's cross, they have eternal life. For the Bible says, for the wage of sin and death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, tonight, we're going to get right into our lesson so we can get going. But before we get going, 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Talking about saints today. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall return unto fable. Have you ever noticed how some people appear to have or known or know and believe the truth to be on the right track concerning sound Bible teaching? Uh, but then suddenly went off into apostasy. Um, they went away from the word of God, my brothers and sisters. Um, sure, we all have. Like me, many went to a Bible-believing church for years, seemingly maturing in the, in the scriptures. Notice I said seemingly, but were, were we really maturing in the scriptures? Like me, many professed Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. Perhaps they even taught Sunday school or sang in the choir like I did. Then one day you found out that they returned to their old denomination, or perhaps throughout the Bible and God all together and went back into the world. This should not, this should not shock or disappoint us because 2 Timothy 2.25, look what Paul says. It was God's comment on these events thousands of years before they happened. We start at 2 Timothy 2.24 and read the end of the chapter. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, after teach in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are, who are taken captive by him at his will. The Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, said the servant of the Lord must not strive. And my, my, my brothers and sisters, or pick fights and argue, act and combative. God's man or woman should be gentle unto all men, all people, apt, able to teach, patience, long-suffering. We should make every attempt possible to reach Christians and non-Christians, my brothers and sisters. We should reach them with the gospel message to the lost. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4, Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And he rose again the third day. And sound Bible teaching to the saved. All scripture taught in light of the Pauline doctrine. Opposition will arise. So we should be patient and do it all in meekness. Some situation would take much longer than others, my brothers and sisters. But look what Paul says. God, our Savior, he will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. It is God's will that all individuals trust his only begotten son as their personal savior. It is also his will that we come into the knowledge of truth, especially Christians. However, he will not force his word on either group, uh, the believers or the non-believers. My brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that. If you want to be submissive to God's will, you must first read his word so that you can understand his will. God the Father's ultimate will is to glorify his son, the Lord Jesus Christ in both the heaven and the earth. It's in the Bible. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 9 through 10, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in him that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. No matter what happens in the meantime, one day God would appoint Jesus Christ as the head of the governments of the heaven and the earth. So we have God's will, my brothers and sisters. And I want you to understand that God will accomplish that by two means, using the nation of Israel as his chosen people for the earth and utilizing us, the church, the body of Christ, as his chosen people in the heavens. If you read God's word, it's in there, my brothers and sisters. 
So, but clearly, God has set the nation of Israel to aside, set them aside. And God has temporarily set the nation of Israel aside. Currently, God is not dealing with the nation of Israel with so many things. So God, God will does not involve the nation of Israel today. Right now, the Lord is calling out a people for his name from the people of the world. And this spiritual entity, creature of believers, is called the church, the body of Christ. That's us. That is what God is doing today. If you have trusted Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary, you are a member of his new creature in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. And that is God's will to have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of truth. Now to our lesson today, headship goes back to creation. Wives rolled, helper, Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I would make him a help meet for him. Yes, man needs help. It is not good that a man be alone. Purpose of the woman's creation, the Bible reveals it, is to help the husband. It is important for us to look clearly at what the Bible says on the subject and why the Bible doesn't apply our modern role, uh, word role to marriage. The scriptures are clear about the unique responsibility God assigns to the wife. The head of Jesus Christ, God the Son, it's the Father, God the Father, as Jesus, as the Son, makes himself willingly submissive to his functional head, the Father. Therefore, just as Christ is submissive to his head, God the Father, and to, and, and to his authority and leadership over him, so the wife is to be submissive to her head, the husband, and to his leadership and authority over her. The truth is not cultural or chauvinistic, but it's design and pattern that God has established from creation regarding man and woman. Headship goes back to creation, my brothers and sisters. Now, there is so much sin and temptation that results from women. We're going to talk about this. A wife is to be her husband's helpmate and a lifetime companion, friend, and a lover for her husband to enjoy every day and vice versa. Ephesians 5.33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. In 1 Timothy 2.9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest appearance with shame, faithfulness, and sobriety, not with broaded hair, or gold, a pearl, or costume. A wife is to be modest in public. A modest woman is a lady. There is much sin and temptation that results from women showing too much skin in the public. Did you hear that? Just think of the just think of the pleasure of knowing that no one sees too much of your wife's legs and other parts of her body. My brothers and sisters, Christ is head. Ephesians 1 22 says, and has put all under things, all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. The word head is clearly a metaphor that occurs in a context dealing with Christ's authority over all things. Colossians 2.10, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. This clearly implies that Christ is the only leading authority figure, head over all other authority in the universe. In the context where the church is subject unto Christ. Ephesians 5, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Christ is said to be the head of the church. Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body, which indicates that the word head, once again, implies authority. The metaphor for head always means leader and authority. It is true that through the head, we are nourished because we take in food through the mouth. This would speak of nourishment and growth. Ephesians 4, 15, but speaking the truth in love may, may, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. But does, this does not change the primary meaning of the metaphor, which points to authority. It is only a secondary application, meaning that the one in authority, Christ, 
also lovingly supplies our spiritual needs as a good leader would. Now, when the head is used metaphorically, or figuratively as it is here, it refers to priority and function. That is what the head of our body does. It runs the body. It is in charge. It is direction center of the body. Used metaphorically, therefore the word head means primary leadership, and thus it is used in this passage. Only the gospel can transform, let me say this, disobedient, lawless creatures into obedient, submissive citizens of heaven and earth. A sinner desires to satisfy the corrupt nature by indulging in lawlessness. He relished rebellion against God and his commandments. It is very important that if, if, if my brothers and sisters, if you are true, Holy Spirit and dwell believer, before we get into submissions deep into it, please marry someone who is also a member of the body of Christ. The Lord makes it explicitly clear that Christians are not to marry unbelievers and Christians are not even to date unbelievers under any circumstance. The scripture makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 7, 30 39, that Christians are to marry only in the Lord. And here's one, here's one crucial verse that is often ignored today regarding marriage. The Apostle Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, but we'll read verses 14 and 15. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelief, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what concord, my brothers and sisters, has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? The Holy Spirit through Paul taught that we should not mix with unbelievers in religious gatherings. Moreover, these verses would also forbid courtship and marital relationships with any people who have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ's finished cross work as sufficient payment for their sin. We do not marry lost people and we do not marry denominational people. These relationships will only handle God's working in us and through us, grace believers. Christians struggle with submitting to the authority. Many of them do, including teachers, bosses, government officials. That reflects our uncooperative attitude towards God's word. However, through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, Christians possess a renewed mind and conscience which guides them to be obedient to God's word. And when they don't obey the Holy Spirit, it pricks them, convicts them, the conscience and prompts prompt them to repent. In other words, have a change of mind. And repentance bring awareness of our need to submit. The word submission makes many uh, Christians uncomfortable. They swarm or murmur against submission. Somewhere along the line, Christians have come to a false notion about what, what submission means in the Bible. Because of Satan and his attacks, on the biblical submission, Christians have come to think of submission as oppressive. When the topic comes up, the worldly point to the, the worldly point to Paul's passage in Ephesians: Wives submit to your own husband, and they cry foul. They brand these verses as sexist, or even ran about the passage as justification for husbands mistreating or abusing their wife. Satan has to deceive them into thinking that these words prove the church expects women to stay married to these abusers and all of that. This is not the biblical understanding of submission. The biggest problem with this view, the verse has been stripped of its context to promote the idea that the Bible is, is, is sexist. In fact, taken in context, the Bible depicts the perfect relationship between husband and wife. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 24, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and the church, the body of Christ, is the example how the husband is to relate to his wife. How often Christian couples completely disregard or review, abuse this verse, these verses. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, it contains the Lord's wisdom regarding marriage. Read it. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. As long as the Lord Jesus Christ is put first in the marriage relationship, 
it would survive and bring glory and honor to him. Submission, Ephesians 5, 21 through 22, submitting yourself to one another, fear of, of, of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. The wife should acknowledge the husband headship over the household. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. But, and here's the important point, the husband is not to be a taskmaster who lords and controls his wife's every move. The Lord Jesus is the head of the church, just as the husband is the head of the wife. The Lord is not a dictator over the church, which is his body. Likewise, the husband should not dominate and bully his wife. Jesus Christ does not take away our free will. And neither should the husband try to take away the free will of his wife. Submission has nothing to do with equality. Headship has nothing to do with equality. Men and women are equal under God in every way. The word of God tells us that the wives are submitted to their husbands as submission rendered by them truly is submission rendered to Christ himself. When the wife yields her will to that of her husband, she yields to the Lord, provided the husband's directions are in fear of God. In other words, the husband is doing what God would have him to do. Ephesians 5.21, or in line with God's will. Fear meaning what pleases God. According to Paul, a faithful husband is willing to lay down his life for his wife. He is not a tyrant who forces her to submit to his sinful human desires, but abandons his own will, he affections and needs for her sake as he follow God's will and God's word to love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Further, Paul exhort the husband to love his wife as he loved his own body and equates the husband care of his wife with that of Christ for his church. A loving husband submits his will to that of Christ. And in doing so, he imitates him in the marriage relationship. In this context, the wife willingly surrender her husband just as her husband chooses to render his will to Christ. Submission based on love bring peace and harmony to the family. The word of God gives the reason why wives should be submissive. Just as Jesus divinely appointed head or authority over the church to one new man, body of Christ, in the same way, the husband's divinely appointed head or authority of his wife, just as Jesus provides for the welfare of his church, the body of Christ, so the husband's responsible to protect and provide for his wife and family. In both cases, the responsibility to protect is inseparable, linked with the responsibility to provide spiritual leadership. If the husband truly loves his wife, the wife will, by instinct, will love him in return. She will reciprocate that love that she receives from her husband. If Jesus Christ really loved the church and he did, the church will love him in return automatically, which we should do. We love him because he first loved us. Husband ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. And I hope we understand that. And the extent of the wife's submission to her husband is in everything. That is, in every area of life and every issue that may arise, those which the wife may agree with and those which she may not. Again, in everything is limited only to those directives of the husband that which are in fear of God. In other words, what's in line with God and God's word. My brothers and sisters, now, note that Paul, in Ephesians 5, 20, wives, submit yourself to your own husband, to the Lord, for the husband head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior. Note that Paul does not say that the husband ought to be the head of the wife, but rather the husband is the head of the wife. It is a stated fact. Some husbands, they are weak, ineffective, and just plain lousy heads of their wives, but they are still in that position of authority. In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. In this verse, Paul was referring to creation order and how God established male headship, authority over the woman. Paul verifies that this was designed, God created for marriage from the beginning. 
and he verifies this when using the expression of man be created in God's image, the image of God, and how the woman was created for the man's existence. The woman is for the man. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 through 9, the Lord has assigned the wife the duty or being a husband, yet disobedience must be a voluntary submission on her part, and the only and that, that only to her, her own husband, not to every man is saying, to one of the most difficult concepts in God's word is biblical submission. My brothers and sisters, and women are not commanded to submit to their husband because God's ensure that men would be uh, just just or loving, when a wife submits to her husband, she is actually submitting unto God. Do we understand that? When a wife submits to her husband, she does not try to take leadership from him. My brothers and sisters, women use many tacks to try taking control of leadership, including nagging, deception, and manipulation. This always results in sin and often sorrowful consequences. When a woman resorts to these tactics, she is trying to usurp God's good design of relationship role. A submissive wife must first learn to trust God, goodness, and his sovereignty. However, a submissive wife is not relegated to idly sitting by while her husband make all the family decisions. In a godly marriage, husband and wife work as a team. When a decision cannot be jointly agreed upon, the leader makes it, knowing he is responsible foremost unto God for the decision. In these circumstances or in a decision that the husband must make alone, a submissive wife is not overstepping her boundaries by offering counseling. In other words, she might have some great ideas. So godly husband, take time and listen. My lovely wife always have great ideas of what we should do and things we should do. And guess what? Majority of the time when we look at them together, I always come and say, honey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. In other words, also she must learn to do it in a way that shows respect for his God-given position as head of the family. And she always reverence me as the head no matter what might come up a situation. A submissive woman also uh, offers abundant encouragement, understanding making decisions is a heavy responsibility on a man's shoulder. Some women are not satisfied with it. They want to be in charge, but realistic marriage cannot work this way. Unity requires a relational structure. We see this in the pattern in other relationships, but submissive is never a sign of value. Jesus submitted to the will of his father, Matthew 26, 39. It would be heresy, heresy to say that Jesus is of lesser value than the father. Christ lived in perfect submission to the father. God the father did not coerce him to become flesh and dwell among us. John 1, 14 tells us that Jesus chose to enter the fallen sinful world to lay down his life on the cross, John 15, 13, so that God could save the world through him. Jesus Christ came from heaven of his own volition to die on the cross. He chose to place himself under the authority of the Father while incarnate. Matthew records Christ's perfect submission, most vivid in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his crucifixion. The gospel writer draws us into Jesus in communion with the Father. We see Jesus' anguish as he faces the horrors of the cross. Jesus' words reverberate through the ages. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. Matthew 26, 39. Even with the terror of death looming, Christ does not exercise his own will, but he obeys his father. In the garden, Jesus refused to avoid the cross. He pleads in agony for strength to fulfill his father's will. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Look at Hebrews 5, 7 through 8. Hebrews 5, 7 through 8. Who in the days of his flesh, talking about Christ, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard 
and that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Perfect submission made Jesus subject to the unjust control and power of sin for man. He stood silent before Pilate. Pilate asserts his authority over Christ, John 19 and 10. Then says Pilate unto him, speakest thou not to me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? John 19 and 11. Look at what Jesus answered. Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it was given thee from above. Don't you realize I have power? This is what Pilate is saying to you. Don't you realize I have power to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. This is God's will that I go to the cross to die for the sins of the world. John 10, 17, 18. Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life? Look at what Jesus said. He said, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man take it from it, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. My brothers and sisters, this commandment have I received of my father. And look at Philippians 2, 6 through 7, 6 through 11. Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And he being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has also exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ, our humble and loving Savior, died for us out of obedience to God, his Father. Now God the Father has placed God the Son above all things. One day every creature we're bowing reverence to Jesus Christ, confessing him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. They are one, and Jesus cannot be of lesser value. His submission had nothing to do with his value. It had to do with God-ordained structure. It is the same with husband and wife. Submission takes humility. It also takes a lot of prayer and relying on the Holy Spirit, but so does God godly leadership. Women can look unto Jesus as an example and reflect his love and self-sacrifice as they lovingly choose to submit unto the husband God has placed in their lives. As we learn from past study, as to be expected, when God's design is ignored, like the Corinthian group, they suffer greatly from spiritual madness and mayhem. Hence, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians women to keep silent and ask their husbands at home. It does not mean that women are forbidden to converse at all within the church building. They are not to lead the entire congregation. The men in the assembly were to stop being weak men and set things in order. Yes, women can speak in church. Indeed, they can ask questions. However, as we saw with Corinthians, they can get carried away and draw the whole assembly into Satan's trap. Sometimes people ask, why can't women be in leadership over men? Let me affirm that in no way do the Bible's teaching on this matter mean that women are less worthy, less useful, or less valuable. Not at all. The Bible's teaching also have nothing to do with talent. Some women, some women are fantastic teachers and leaders, and they should use their gifts accordingly, except for in those areas where Scripture has specifically stated. Women in the local church have a ministry towards other women. How do you know that? Look at this. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husband, and to love their children. Titus 2, 3, verses 3 through 4. While you are not in a leadership, in the leadership, the local church could not function 
without your ministry, women. What it does have to do with is the order of creation. Adam was created first and Eve being deceived. God does not want the local church to be vulnerable to the devil wiles as Eve was when she was deceived by Satan. There is a salvation Deliverance from Satan deception. When men who truly know the word of God write the divide and stand on it, when they know what God requires as for his leadership, they can lead the local assembly effectively. This is why gender is an issue in 1 Timothy 2 12. It's not that God picks on women, rather, he is safeguarding Christian women from deception. For Satan is the one who likes to pick on women. Remember, Eve? The real question we should ask. Be asking is not white women can't lead. The real question, and that is the same question we often face in our marriages is, what does God's word say? This is God speaking. And I am his ambassador. And I teach and preach what he has given to me, rightly divided. And the overwhelming testimony in scripture that men were spiritual leaders. My brothers and sisters. Not one woman is known to have written any portion of the Bible. Moses, Isaiah, all of them, Jonah, e Ezekiel, Hosea, Jeremiah. My brothers and sisters, only male relatives of Aaron were to be priests in Israel. There were no priests whatsoever in the Mosaic law system. Look at the apostles. None were women. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James. Do we see, my brothers and sisters, God has a creative order. And when we step out of that order, we are rejecting God and we're rejecting his word. And we're going to pick up next week. Let us pray. Father, here we thank you for the word. We pray as those who are listening, we pray they are encouraged and that they were enlightened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.